and welcome to class 21 where we're going to talk about state and local government. Uh, before we get into the uh, lecture itself, this is just a quick note that this will be a bit of a schematic overview of state and local government structure and functions. I didn't want to provide too much information that would be overwhelming, especially right before the midterm. So if you were, have further questions, if you want more detail, feel free to reach out and I can we can talk about it in more detail or I can connect you with some other resources or videos or um, readings that might be of interest to you. So let's go ahead and get started. So today we are talking about state and local governments, and that means we are going to be focusing again on the question of federalism. Uh, we're going to look at the role of state and local governments in policymaking, the structure of state and local governments. Uh, and towards the end of class, we're going to be looking at the constraints and opportunities, and therefore the disadvantages of state and local policymaking. So, a quick review of federalism before we get into it. It's that uh, that uh, as it comes back to haunt us again in our discussion here, um, that the Constitution, as you all as you all are probably tired of hearing by now, divides power between the federal and state governments. Again, we have to think of the Constitution as much as a uh, as a um, contract that sets up a government between sovereign states as it is as a national government on which we are all citizens of. The, and so there's a this dual sovereignty between the state governments and the federal government in which the, the Constitution ex expanded the power of the federal government, giving Congress and the president a series of enumerated or expressed powers. Um, these were powers that were, did not have during the Articles of Confederation, but the state still retain a significant amount of power in the Constitution. They could establish local governments and account for how these governments are structured and what functions they role play. They also have uh, the supreme independent authority over these local governments. Um, they have the power to ratify amendments to the Constitution. And so this, the federal government cannot change the Constitution without the consultation of the states. Uh, finally, the Tenth Amendment reserves all non-enumerated powers to the states or to the people. Um, and so the, the framers of the Constitution really believe that this would be a dual uh, in which both would both uh, levels of government would share significant authority. However, as we know from the first uh, from our earlier discussion about federalism, this is an evolving relationship that the early days of dual federalism eventually gave way in the 20th century to cooperative federalism as the states and federal government shared responsibility for joint ventures. Then with the 80s and the 90s, we had the devolution, uh, the devolution of power from the federal government back to the states and through the use of things like block grants to shift the funding and uh, priority to the states while also giving them greater flexibility. So with that review in mind, let's look a little bit more detailed at how state governments are actually structured. The first thing that comes to mind in any state when we're talking about state governments is the role of the governor, because the governor is like a mirror of the president or the, um, that the governor's office is like the executive branch, um, that they are the most visible state politician, just like the president is the most visible uh, politician in the country. And many of the state constitutions actually empower the governor vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state legislature more than the United States Constitution empowers the president over Congress. Um, this is both uh, a function of the like these formal powers that the, the, the governors are given that we'll talk about, but also the fact that in many states, the legislatures are not particularly professionalized, that the governor is in office year round um, and is a single person so that the governor can act more efficiently and expediently while state legislatures are often part time positions uh, and are not in session year round. So if we're thinking about the formal powers of the governor, uh, much like they very much mirror the formal powers of the president. Just like the president gives a State of the Union address, the governor gives a State of the State address. The governor also issues budget proposals, much like the president, that shape the kind of legislative priority and agenda of the legislature in that term. Now, a big difference is in the veto power of the governor. Over most state governors have a line item veto. This was a veto that, we, as we talked about when we talked about the presidency, that the Supreme Court denied that the president has the right to do, that the president cannot strike out a single line of a piece of legislation that they are signing, while a governor does have this ability. 
Furthermore, 30% of governors have what's known as a mandatory veto power, which allows them to send a bill back to the legislature re requesting a specific amendment to it. Um, so this gives the governor a lot more formal legislative power than the Constitution gives the president to participate in po direct policymaking. Much like the president, governors can also call special sessions of the legislature, and they can also pardon and commute sentences uh, for state crimes. But the governor, much like the president, also has a series of informal powers. Um, as the most public state-level politician, they are often asked to, uh, they can often motivate their agenda through their publicity. They can, they're often asked to fundraise for their, uh, for their party and for political allies for both local and national office. They also, uh, by virtue of having this year-round office, are able to kind of exert much more authority in legitimacy in the public eye than the state legislature. Uh, most people, probably more people, probably know who their governor is than necessarily who their state assembly person or their state senator is. So this affords the governor a lot of latitude to try to influence public opinion in the state and get their agenda passed. Now, if we look at legislators and legislatures. Um, the, all, but number, all the state legislatures except for Nebraska have a bicameral legislature so that it mirrors the, fed, the Congress of the United States in that there's two houses, usually an upper and a lower house. Um, these are buried in their particulars and their size. For example, if we look at the, uh, the, the, the lower, lower houses, Alaska has the smallest uh, state house with 40 members, while New Hampshire has the largest lower, lower house with 400 members. State Senates raise in size from 20 members in Alaska to 67 members in Minnesota. And as you can see, those aren't necessarily tracking differences in population. It's not like the most populous states like California have the largest legislatures. And the size of this institution can have significant effects on representation and policymaking. Um, the larger bodies are able to better represent their constituents because there's a lower ratio of constituent to representative. Um, but larger institutions also make passing legislation harder. The more representatives you have in the body, the more kind of compromises and deals you have to make. Also, 15 states have legislative term limits on their legislatures, which is something that does not exist at the federal level. And there are some advantages that, uh, to this that people have argued for, that many argue that this can increase diversity, that the turnover is good because it can be, provide a check on corruption, uh, kind of campaigning, and people are going to be more focused on actually getting their job done if they know that their time is limited. But many political scientists who have studied uh, state term limits have found a series of of disadvantages. Uh, these include deprofessionalization, which we'll talk about in a second, but that um, but that the legislatures are not uh, as professionalized. They, there's a loss of institutional knowledge, the loss of social ties that allows for legislatures to effectively get things done. When we look at the functions of the legislature, much like Congress, the um, the legislature has three main functions: lawmaking, representation, and oversight. Um, now, unlike the Congress, leg state legislatures have to work much more closely with the governor to pass legislation because of the expanded powers of the governor. Furthermore, every state except for Vermont has a balanced budget amendment or a balanced budget requirement in their state constitution. And this places much more severe restrictions on the types of laws that can get passed because you cannot kind of exceed the revenue that you're bringing in through either taxes or grants from the federal government. Um, when we come to representation and oversight, these function very similarly to the National Congress. That they, uh, that many represent the representatives try to bring particularized benefits to their districts. That all the state legislatures have a kind of single-member district uh, system in which they are representing particular constituents in particular geographic districts, and they can oversee the state bureaucracy and the and the governor's office just as the federal as Congress can oversee the federal bureaucracy. They can hold hearings, they can request documents, subpoena testimony, all of these same things. Where there's a significant difference is on this question of professionalism. That legislative professionalism is usually assessed in three key factors. The first is their salary. Um, the higher the salary of the state legislature, the more professional they are because they can devote, they can make being a state legislature a full-time job. Um, this is, it means that they are not required to be working other jobs in order to provide for themselves, and they're able to focus more of their effort in the actual um, work of being a state legislature. 
Furthermore, they also the second kind of, the second assessment criteria is how long are they in session? Is it, does the legislature only meet for a few months? Uh, once a year? Does it meet several times a year for longer periods of time? The more constant they're focused on being legislatures, the more professionalized they are. The more experience they're going to have, the more ability they are going to have to get things done. And finally, how large are their staffs? Smaller staff size means that the legislatures are going to be more reliant on, are going to be less professionalized, they're going to have less uh, research opportunities, less ability to to communicate effectively with their constituents, and they're going to have to be dedicating more of their time to kind of basic administrative functions. Larger staffs means that they're going to be able to uh, delegate tasks and work more effectively and efficiently. Uh, and this professionalism has a significant impact because the lower level of professionalism in a state legislature, the more room there is for influence for outside lobbying, outside lobbyists, right? If you don't have a large staff size, you're not paid very well, and you're not in session for a long time, there's a huge incentive for you as a state legislator to simply take these pre-written bills that we talked about when we talked about uh, policymaking and lobbying uh, from interest groups and just say like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and that raises important questions about the quality of both policy making and representation. When we move, you know, further down the Russian nesting doll here to the local governments, we also uh, see similar kind of relationships between the state and local governments as we saw between the state and federal governments. On the one hand, uh, the Supreme Court has upheld Dillon's rule, which is that state action trumps local government. Um, that any kind of state that the state that the state action holds sovereignty and ultimate authority over local over local government action. However, there, at the same time, there's also a tradition of home rule in which the local governments at the county or the mun municipal level exercise a certain amount of independence from local governments, just like the states exercise independence from the federal government. And the particular roles and structure of a state of a local government, whether at the county or the city level, is spelled out in its charter which you can think of as kind of like an analogous to a constitution. So a big constraint for state and, or for local government action is the sources of revenue, that most of the revenue for local governments comes from property taxes. Um, a great deal of unevenness on the revenue opportunities of different localities within the same state. Uh, if you know anything about school district funding, it's often tied to property taxes, which means that wealthier state, wealthier uh, cities, wealthier counties are able to spend much more money on school on their school districts, which leads to inequalities in outcomes here. State uh, local governments can also raise money through sales taxes, um, and, but they're also reliant on grants from other levels of government, and this creates an incentive for municipalities to keep taxes low. Uh, they want people to build businesses and buy homes in the area. Um, and this creates kind of double-dip fiscal crisis. On the one hand, uh, they, want to, they want to keep these taxes low in order, to, in order to, to incentivize people to start businesses and build homes in their city and not move outside of the city limits, not move outside of the county line where the taxes might be lower. Um, but the more people that you have in the city, the greater or, or the county, the greater demand that you're going to have for government services. So, so you have these competing demands on local governments to both enhance government services, fund schools, build new roads, maintain lo uh, you know public 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 uh, community centers and parks, um, but also keep the ta property taxes and sales taxes low. So this is the kind of balancing act that local governments have to uh, pursue, especially independent municipalities like cities. Now, if we're looking at the structure of county and city governments, there's a few different models. So let's start with the county governments. The first model is a commission that at, ca at the county level that there is an elected commission um, and they are going to be in the kind of per uh, and they are going to exercise all of the executive and, ex and legislative power at the county level. There is also a council administrator model in which there's an elected council that kind of takes over the legislative uh, authority of the county. And then that council appoints an administrative, and then a, a county administrator that deals with the executing of county ordinances. 
The third model is a council executive model in which the, the people elect both a council and a head executive. Um, so there's a separation of the legislative and executive power here, but both of them are democratically elected. Um, Los Angeles County has an elected commission model, and it's made up of a five-person board of supervisors that is often called the Five Little Kings. So the tasks that county governments perform vary from state to state. Um, they often have uh, a county courthouse and county officials, county sheriff that is often elected, a county clerk, assessor, treasurer, a county coroner that is also sometimes elected. Um, so there is a kind of more of more to the government than just these commissions or, or county councils. Um, but they and they perform a variety of tasks, um, such as investigating, uh, such as providing law enforcement, managing taxes, the collection and distribution of funds. City county engineers will oversee the maintenance and construction of the infrastructure. They maintain roads, bridges, courthouses, jails, parks, pools, public libraries, hospitals, clinics, schools. These are all things that are in the purview of county governments. Now, within counties, there can be independent cities that, are, that have an independent charter. And these city governments can take, usually take one of two forms. There might be a mayor or council model where there is both an elected mayor and an elected city council. Uh, and this is the model that Los Angeles has with a 15 member city council. They each member represents single member representative districts within the city of Los, Los Angeles and an elected mayor. Uh, but you can also have a council manager model. And this is where you have an elected city council and maybe a mayor, but you also have an appointed city manager who is a kind of a non-political administrator who deals with the kind of day-to-day -day functioning of the city. And these municipal governments are responsible for providing clean water, for sewage and garbage disposal. They also maintain city facilities, such as parks, streetlights, stadiums. They also address zoning and building ordinances. They promote the city's economic developments. And these rely on mostly property taxes, uh, and user fees for different services, um, you know, like such as water distribution, uh, trash collection, in order to fund their uh, fund their activities. So we're going to talk in a second about state political culture and talking about the constraints and opportunities of state, go state and local governments. But first, if you need to take a break, pause this video. Now would be a great time to do so. In the 1966 book, American Federalism, A View from the States, Elazar uh, argues that there are three models of state political culture, that you can look at the way that politics works in the different states by three in three broad categories. Uh, the first is what he calls a moralistic culture. Uh, and this is these states are states that view the government as a means to promote the common good and better society. There is a kind of moralistic evaluation of their governments. They want the governments to be honest um, and not corrupt. They want to see government as a positive thing um, that is going to pursue the common good. This, according to Elazar, has its origins in the Puritan culture of New England. And as European settlers in that region spread westward to the upper Great Lakes and upper Midwest, you can see, uh, you can see the this kind of uh, latitudinal spread from out of Puritan New England to the uh, Great Lakes and Upper Midwest and down to the West Coast. That this is kind of how it's this political culture spread throughout the states. Um, these states are likely to have high levels of political par participation. These states often make it easier to vote. Um, they have lower restrictions, often have same day registration. Um, for example, the state of California, many localities are experimenting with automatic vote by mail, where you receive a ballot in the mail and you can drop it off up until election day at any voting center. These states are often going to have more contested elections as well between the two political, between uh, the political parties. Moralistic cultures, state political cultures, Elazar contends, are going to prioritize meritocracy over party loyalty. So you're more likely to see people vote for different party members in different elections in order to prioritize uh, the best person for the job. The second political culture that Elazar outlines is what he calls an individualistic culture. And these are in green here in this map. 
individualist cultures view government less as a kind of moral good, but more as a way for citizens to achieve their individual interests. They think of the government as providing essential services uh, and, and then giving individuals and businesses the ability to pursue their own private goals rather than kind of having a robust conception of the common good. The, this political culture originated in the non-Puritan European settlers in the Mid-Atlantic region in states like New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, and that the, these this political culture, these people often came from Germany and England, and then they spread throughout Middle America. So you have the kind of the Midwest, uh, the Rust Belt states have this kind of, this this individualistic political culture, um, and also kind of mount, some of the Mountain West states like Wyoming and Nevada. These states have an emphasis on the business environment. They often have low, uh, emphasis on lower, lower tax rates for individuals and corporations. And here they also place a greater, uh, greater emphasis on party loyalty. These, these states tend to be dominated by political machines, like in New York, in Chicago, and Illinois. Um, and there's going to be greater emphasis on party loyalty. If you're a Democrat, you're always going to vote for a Democrat. If you're a Republican, you're always going to vote for a Republican. The third political culture that Elazar outlines is the traditionalist culture, and this is the yellow on the map here, and this is primarily in the southern United States. And they view government as a means to maintain existing social order, and these include social hierarchies. That um, politics is much more elite driven in this idea, in this uh, political culture, and this has its origin in southern slaveholding societies and states in the uh, in the states that, uh, that oh, seceded from the Union in the Civil War and in the general southern uh, southern areas. And these states are more likely to see political participation as a privilege than a right. These are going to prioritize elite-based competition rather than broad-based political action. Uh, that, these, that these states are going to emphasize kind of that policy change has to be approved by those in power. There's not a ton of grassroots movements here. And because of this party competi competition that exists is actually it's going to be not between the two parties, but between different factions within the dominant party. Then many of these states have a dominant political party. Um, there's uh, where the other minority party is not super competitive, but there are different factions within the, the uh, say the Republican Party, such as more socially conservative factions and more libertarian factions vying for political power. Now, since this, this this theory was published in 1966, many people have criticized the kind of geographic determinism uh, around Elazar's theory. Um, they pointed to things like the increase of immigration from um, uh, from South and East Asia, uh, from Africa, that these immigrant uh, immigrant communities don't have. They introduce new forms of political culture. People also point that people have uh, that people are more mobile now that they are more likely to move from state to state. So I, uh, for one, have lived in states from representing all three cultures. I was uh, raised in Virginia, went to college there. Then I went to graduate school in Chicago, Illinois, moving from a traditionalist political culture to an individualistic political culture. And now, obviously, I live in California, where there is a more uh, moralistic political culture. And so this kind of constant movement means that the, there's going to be a lot more flux and a lot more gradations between uh, the state's political culture than Elazar actually um, can, had own original theory contends. So in addition to these political cultures shaping the type of policy making that happens, there's also significant constraints. And this is what Kauser talks about in the uh, Devolution Revolution article from the Principles and Practice re uh, reader that you had for today. So he looks at um, the, the effects of the, the Republican Revolution in the 90s uh, that began with the 1994 midterm election in which Newt Gingrich uh, published this contract with America, this 10-point plan to elect uh, to, to promise to the American people that within the first 100 days, if they are elected, they are going to kind of radically reform the welfare state make government smaller, lower taxes, and imp greatly empower the states to kind of manage their affairs. Um, and so the kind of important context for this is that state budgets are very, far more are going to be far more constrained than the federal government. They don't have the ability to just kind of borrow money infinitely that the federal government does. That Again, every state other than Vermont has a balanced budget amendment, um, so they have limited ability to kind of just spend 
but they also have this incentive to keep taxes lower. It's much easier to kind of move from a state to state to avoid, uh, to, especially for a corporation, to avoid high taxes. You saw this with the kind of all the states trying to appease Amazon in order for Amazon to house their second headquarters in their state or in their locality um, by giving them all sorts of tax incentives and tax, in, uh, tax incremental financing. So state budgets are much more precarious and so this means that the federal government has enormous power to influence the states um, based on their grants. State governments also have income tax structures that tend to be more regressive than the federal government. If you looked at the charts towards the end of the Kauser reading, um, that even that while the federal income tax is very progressive, and that means that the highest um, highest earning people pay the highest tax rates, many state governments' income taxes are much less progressive, and they often have a flat tax on consumption, like a sales tax, which is going to be more regressive because lower income households are going to spend more of their income in consumption, where higher income, more proportion of their income in, in consumption and not savings. So they're going to end up paying more of their proportionately of, in taxes. And so the incentive structure here, again, is that they are trying to maintain low taxes for business and wealthy people, because if you price them out of the state if by raising their taxes and they go to another state, your tax revenues are going to fall and you're not going to be able to provide as many social services. So during the devolution of the revolution of the 1990s, um, when there were significant shifts in the way that social welfare policies were funded and implemented by the federal government due to the Republican majority in Congress after the 1994 midterm elections, this really created a shift in the incentive structure for how state governments were going to provide these welfare provisions. So your reading talks about how um, in a compromise um, between the Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, and President Bill Clinton, um, Medicaid remained a kind of, it did not did not become a block grant, but TAMP, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, became a block grant for the states. So this, um, with the idea that it would give the states greater flexibility about how to provide this service to their citizens. But in reality, what happened is the states ended up cutting funding um, because the block grants were much lower than the federal funding that they were receiving previously. And this led to a rollback in state state uh, state welfare provisions, even though the federal government did not like mandate this. Right. So these block grants end up rolling back the expansiveness of these state programs. On the other hand, uh, CHIP, this, uh, the child health insurance program um, that provided a kind of bridge uh, program for, health, for, for families that were too, uh, uh, that, had, that were not poor enough to qualify for, for Medicaid, uh, but Medicare, for, but we, were, um, we did not have the means to purchase private insurance. That meant for everyone that the state government uh, funded for it, this the federal government would fund $2, just about $2. And this gave an incentive for the states to massively expand the program um, because they were for every dollar, every extra dollar they spent, they got two more dollars. And so again, state policy making is often constrained by these fiscal priorities and these and the way that the grant structure at the federal level happens. So states don't have this kind of unlimited authority, even in their kind of the areas of, that they are constitutionally entitled to, they're going to be constrained by federal action. But at the same time, while the states and local governments are constrained, they also re have unique opportunities. And your other, in your re reading from Rosen, uh, the Los Angeles Times piece also talked about the unique opportunity of state and local governments to take the lead on climate change. So here is a brief video. Climate is is a remote. It's not jobs. It's not crime. It's not childcare. It's not the the meat and potatoes of politics. So to the extent that Trump is the anti climate change, that then makes climate change part of the debate in a way it would never be if uh, Trump was not the president. Governor Brown threw down the gauntlet at the administration of President Donald Trump. If we have to, we'll defund. We give tremendous amounts of money to California. So you're California, going to California. Is out of control, as you know. California will launch its own damn satellite. Now, climate change is real. Maybe not in my life. I'll be dead. What am I, 79? Do I have five years more? 20? I don't know. I don't go what that long. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. 
the null hypothesis. He's saying there is no climate change. Yeah, a lot of it's, it's a hoax. hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry. It's a hoax. A lot. And because of that, what California is doing is silly. So it does set up a contrast, an either-or. Trump, California. My goal is not to let California get isolated as an aggressive actor in, in reducing uh, greenhouse gases, but to find allies. I'm delighted to join you here in California, where, where climate action is alive and well, thanks to the remarkable leadership of your great governor and my friend Jerry Brown. Thank you, sir. California is pursuing the most aggressive and forthright climate change agenda of any state in the country, I'd say of any government in, in the Western Hemisphere. Anything you do, California sets the rules. Emission standards for cars, pollution standards for all kinds of industry. Uh, so we have uh, the opportunity and the power to curb greenhouse gas emissions, and that's what we're doing. And other states have a similar power. So obviously what we can do, we're going to do. But given the competitive nature in the world, the single-minded focus, not just of Xi, but of, of Putin and, and others, uh, America is fiddling around now, goofing off. The world is changing. And how do we adjust to it? A world of 7.3 billion uh, with a billion automobiles and all the pressures that that's costing. That, it's difficult. It's not easy. If we're going to say we're not going to play with the rest of the world because we're America first, America alone, and we're not going to invest in science, we're going to deny climate change, uh, that means the end of America as a, as a great world leader. So I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe there is a reversal. The Trump hypothesis is being uh, severely challenged in Washington today. So as uh, that video clip from Jerry Brown suggested, um, the state and local governments have actually taken a lead in response to the Trump administration's action, a planned withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and more than 400 city leaders and 25 states have pledged robust climate action. The 25 states have formed the, uh, the, climate, the U.S. Climate Alliance, and this is uh, kind of the membership as of 2019. Um, and you can see that it's high, it includes several very populous states like California, um, New York, Illinois, Michigan, Virginia, uh, Washington. That these are, and, and that these states have. Uh, and these states and organizations have vowed to uphold the country's Paris Pledge and to take specific order to states. As your Rosen article notes, this accounts for about two thirds of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in total, given the population sizes of these states. So this, which means that there is a significant role that the state and local governments can play in curbing greenhouse gas emissions and fighting climate change at the state level. And as Brown suggested um, political polarization is playing a role here too, right? If we think back to our discussion of negative partisanship, right? Um, the fact that the Trump administration has come out so robustly against climate change, against Paris Accord, um, that even that many, you can, any Democrats, even if you don't particularly care about climate change, you might be incentivized to um, take action because it allows you to distance yourself from Trump and appeal and activate those affective par uh, polarization. Um, and the states and local governments have like unique opportunities and strengths. They can st set uh, RPSs, renewable portfolio standards, that set, um, that set standards for the amount of electricity and energy that is, is used in the state has to come from renewable sources. They can have different ordinances on building codes that are going to make buildings more energy efficient. They can also pass, like California, ta cap and trade programs and other ways to price carbon. They can provide tax incentives for electric vehicles and for installing solar panels. So there's a lot that state and local governments can do with their tools. They can't obviously pass nationwide policies, but there are real powers. But like I suggested, the size and jurisdictions of states are limited. They can't California can try to you take advantage of its massive market share to set, to set the standard, but it cannot influence policy past its borders. And so highly greenhouse gas intensive industries can move across the borders to where there are lower regulations, where there isn't a price on carbon. So there are real limits here. 
And as we talked about a second ago, there are real financial challenges and similarly logistical challenges um, that the states just have fewer resources than the federal governments to implement these policies. So while there's a unique opportunity for state action here, given this kind of rollback of action at the federal government, it's not going to be a complete replacement of that action. So that's all we're going to talk about today. As a reminder, um, next class uh, is the mid second midterm. And if you haven't, uh, uh, as a reminder, the format is changed. It's obviously not the multiple choice and the short answer sections. Instead, that you have to answer four of the provided six two, uh, short answer questions with about 200 word answers. I'm not going to count every word. So, you know, there's some flip wiggle room on either side there. These are open note and open book. But any, if you, uh, but you're expected to kind of refer to specific information and cite it from the readings. You don't need to have a works cited page, just a parenthetical bibliography. So, um, AG for the textbook, page 347 or something like that. This will be made available at 9 a.m. on Friday the 27th, and it'll be due at 11.59 p.m. on Saturday the 28th. So you have two days to work on this. It shouldn't take you more than an hour to write. Um, it is intended that for you to take, work, write this when you get a chance. If you have any questions or problems accessing or uploading, don't hesitate to email me. And as a reminder, um, that I've uh, sent out an email uh, last week uh, with updated syllabi changing the way the discussion posts are going to work instead of kind of assigning people each day. Um, I got feedback suggesting it would be easier to give you more flexibility. So again, the change is that you, you can answer any discussion post. You, can, um, you have to post one post and one reply on any of the threads. Your post has to be uploaded by Friday at 9 and then your reply at some, by some point at Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Um, on any of the threads and I'll just kind of and that will be your kind of participation for the week. And so based on the readings and lecture, what do you think the biggest constraint on state and local policymaking is? What do you think is their biggest advantage for, or opportunity for policymaking at the state and local government? So that's it for today's lecture on state, uh, state and local governments. I hope that this was enjoyable. I hope that the information was clear. Uh, if you have any questions, stop into the discussion section, send me an email, drop in office hours, and I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Take care. Uh, good luck with the midterm. Again, if you're having any issues accessing or uploading, please let me know, and I will do my best to get you uh, make sure that you can take the midterm. Uh, thanks, and take care.